All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to be monitoring today. My name is Brittany Daly. I'm with the Institute of Policy Studies. Um, so for tonight's event of Queen Resistance, it's the third event in the IPS's Black History Month series, Liberation in Action. Um, so tonight's discussion is sponsored by, co-sponsored by Spotless Rock. And tonight, we're really going to center on Black women, all Black women, cis, queer, trans, and disabled. Um, we're going to be reclaiming our narratives about navigating existing society. Um, and we're going to also like try our best to like illuminate the ways that we use our voices, our style, and our art to forge a, a path to resistance and liberation. Um, I have, we have some amazing panelists with us tonight, and I'm going to some um, go down one by one and introduce these amazing women uh, to my direct right, there is left. <laughs> I have Brittany Oliver. Uh, she is the Police Account Accountability Coordinator and Communications Associate at the ACLU of Maryland. Um, next to her, I have Michelle Roberts, uh, co-director of the Environmental Justice Health Alliance. Uh, she organizes um, direct action and strategy reforms at the grassroots level to fight pollution and frontline communities. And then I have uh, Michelle Thompson, uh, Executive Director of The Wire, um, where she helps re-entry of Black women, formerly incarcerated Black women. And finally, we have Lauren May. She's a local spoken word poet, activist, and author. And she wrote an amazing little book called Life is, Lo Life is a Lot Like French Fries, <laughs> <laughs> which um, is absolutely good. Um, so we're going to kick off this event with a little performance um, from Miss May, whenever you're ready. Hey guys, so I'm going to do a poem. Um, this poem has a trigger warning for um, sexual assault. Um, and I specifically chose this poem because I feel like it definitely goes hand in hand with resistance because often black girls are taught to be too quiet about the things that they go through. And resistance means putting it out on the table for, you know, discussion and things like this, and healing, most importantly. I stare at myself in the mirror sometimes to remind myself that I am, in fact, here, that this skin and body are both indeed intact in here. Because I heard black girls got a knack for being the best at disappearing hat, you know, gone with the wind without a sound. Black girl born beautiful and black, Black girl born to a depressed black woman. Black girl light up room. Black girl is light. Black girl is lit. Black girl gets sexually assaulted by her brother at age six. Black girl quiet. Black girl don't get no help. Black girl watch as they only help her brother. Black girl kicked out of three schools before age 12. Black girl goes to high school. Black girl goes to school high. Black girl gets diagnosed with depression. Black girl gets raped by four boys in high school. Black girl stops going to high school. Black girl run. Black girl run away. Black girl run away so fast. Black girl missing for three days. And police find black girl with friend. Ask her with tired tongues and rolling eyes why. And I rub my fingers across my palm to show myself that I was indeed intact, in fact, standing there in front of scribbling words and folded arms. The first question was one that still intros my nightmares. The rest left me feeling more criminal today. And at that time, I removed my trust from this unjust system. Black girl involved in group fight. Familiar police tell black girl she's headed for jail. Black girl don't care. Black girl don't know how she's still here. Black girl diagnosed with anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. And in some twist of fate, I am still here, all black girl and alive. Although this black girl trauma is too often criminalized, exacerbated through the juvenile unjust system, truancy, substance abuse, all the black girls who run away with no choice, locked away for simply trying to heal ourselves. I am amazed that I am still here. But I can't ignore the black girls knee deep in the sexual assault to prison pipeline. The black girls whose bodies are used and abused, discarded and missing like old rag dolls, never important enough to be put back together, traumatized and re-traumatized, criminalized for simply being in this body. 
this poverty, this mental state of hopelessness and fear. You know, I can't forget those black girls because I am here and I am them. When a black girl is charged for prostitution, although she is legally too young to consent to sex, it becomes my problem. When the decision is made to punish a young girl for her reaction to trauma, instead of supporting her need to heal, it becomes everyone's problem. See, I know all too well the feeling of being an invisible girl. Silently stroking the length of my arms, reminding myself that I am still here. Praying that someone hears me screaming for the need to heal before I become one of those black girls, a master of this disappearing after another black girl gone with the wind without a. Mm. That was so powerful and moving. I just kind of want everyone mm. to sit for a moment and really take that all in before we continue. Yeah. Great. Now we're back. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take the first question off to you, um, Brittany. Sure. Um, so when we talk about like Black Lives Matter, like even though at its core it is an intersectional movement, right? It started by three women, Black women, two of which identify as queer. Um, but through the, I guess, what and the general public though is understand as a movement to protect Black men from state violence. And I was wondering if you could give me your insight about how how this happened and also how we can shift that narrative to make sure that we're including all black lives, including black women. Um, so thank you uh, everyone for having me. Thank you. Um, so that is that's a very loaded question. Right. <laughs> but we won't get into it. <laughs> Um, but I, I hope that we are able to do this panel and be able to have some new perspectives, some new ways of thinking about things. Um, so I work in uh, communications, work in media. And so this is a question that often comes up a lot, um, you know, in the work that I do, I work at the ACLU of Maryland. Um, and we work, do, do a lot of work around police reform, um, which is oftentimes heavily centered um, on, on men. So what I would like for you all to, uh, to take, take a moment and think about is um, we're all being bombarded with uh, social media and articles and just all of these different uh, mechanisms for talking about, uh, you know, videos and talking about around uh, police brutality and that sort of thing. But one thing, one thing that I want you all to think about is the media and the institutions that are currently in place that report about black, black lives. Um, the majority of media institutions in our country are not owned by black people. Um, they are controlled by white corporate liberal media um, that report out on you know, stories related to black lives however they want, in bits and pieces, the full story. Sometimes it's, it's not the, all, the entire story at all. So when we're talking about police reform and why are men the focus of a lot of these issues, you have to think about where the media, who is reporting the media, mm -hmm. right? Um, right now there is an increase in, um, due to uh, post-election and Donald Trump and him trying to censor, uh, censor the media right now, what you got to think about is where was this outrage about ethics and journalism and reporting when Trayvon Martin was killed, when Michael Brown was killed, when Sandra Bland was killed. Um, we're seeing viral videos, we're seeing bot images of our bodies laying in the streets that you can Google right now and still see. Um, so if anything, that is what my frustration has been. Um, but what I would encourage folks to do is to, is to think about the importance of having control of our own institutions, mm -hmm. our own media institutions, um, reporters, um, media professionals, um, and just doing what they can to, to tell our own stories because a lot of this, a lot of the issues around police reform right now this is not new. These are not new issues. Um, these are just, um, they might be new for some people who've been able to ignore and not have to deal with racism um, 
for a really long time. So I'll stop there. Okay. Um, well, Shonya, um, your, a lot of your work is, you know, helping Black women who I mean, caught up in this mass incarceration system, this that you have going on right now. Um, but again, this is a narrative that focuses on um, Black men, despite the fact, like, is it like an 800% increase in the rate of Black women being incarcerated? Um, and you do a lot of work. Um, um, focusing and centering Black women. So could you speak to when you, uh, when you first got in and like how you got into this work centering on Black women uh, who were formerly incarcerated? Okay, good questions. Um, first of all, I want to give a very special honor to Lauren, right? That's mm -hmm. Lauren, mm -hmm. because um, I felt like she just told my story. Like, I don't even feel like I need to talk tonight right. because I feel like she told the story of all of the women that I know mm -hmm. um, personally, and even from a academic perspective, she told the story of Maya Angelou and Zora Neale Hurston and every girl who's ever been incarcerated and every girl who's ever had a mom that's incarcerated because the most of those individuals that we're speaking about that's becoming incarcerated at such alarming rate are victims of sexual abuse and domestic violence mm -hmm. and therefore suffer to dual diagnoses that include um, trauma and substance abuse. And so instead of the community dealing with the underlying issues that women are dealing with, they are incarcerating them at alarming rate, rates mm -hmm. and then leaving children to basically virtually raise themselves. Um, so when I first started to become aware of the epidemic was basically when I became incarcerated. Because we don't have a prison in DC, I went into the federal system. And so I was able to see women from all, black and brown women from all over the world incarcerated and the majority of them for nonviolent drug offenses. Whereas if I was from a state, I would have been doing time in a local state prison with other local state women who probably had local state crimes. Um, so I ended up serving 18 years. I served 13 of those years in the federal system once the DC Revitalization Act passed. Mm -hmm. In any case, so that's when it became real for me because I was stunned. I had already spent five years in prison before I got into the federal system but I was stunned to see the amount of women that were actually incarcerated. I was in a facility with 1,300 women in Danbury, Connecticut. And that's just one of like five or six federal prisons, not even counting the camps. So um, once I came home, um, getting involved in, in civic engagement and reentry work, I found that the voices of women were missing and that there weren't really many supports in place specifically for women. There were not conversations about gender responsive criminal justice reform mm -hmm. or what are the gender responsive needs of women in prison or the women that are returning from incarceration. So most of our work has been centered around trying to raise awareness and let people know that the, the pipelines to prison are different from women than they are for men right. and that the services that women need when they are incarcerated are different for women than they are for men. Mm -hmm. And when they come home, they have different entry needs. And that's important because the majority of the people that are incarcerated are black men. So it's easy to um, neglect the issues that black women are facing as it relates to mass incarceration because it's impacting black men so severely. Like for me, my father, my husband, my brother have all been impacted by the criminal justice system. But if you ask me about the women, I know it's only the women who I actually serve time with. So it's not as, you know, it's not as, you, you, we really have to make a conscious effort to be intentional about thinking about women when we talk about policing and mass incarceration because this epidemic is impacting us just as much because we are the primary caregivers of children before we become incarcerated. And then once we become incarcerated, the base, basically the whole fabric of the family, family is destroyed and it's impacting communities and schools and it's just having a wide, a wide ranging effect. Yeah. Um, I tend to look at like erasure, right? As like a little, I think it's an act of violence, right? When right. you take someone's history and you tell someone that this, even though they're having the same experience across the board, 
no matter where you go and you tell them that it's not happening like you're messing with someone's head and that, that to me <laughs> that is an act of violence um so this question is for all you like who should we be holding accountable for this like who do i need to be calling up or cussing out? <laughs> let me know please so you want to jump in first? <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for having me here. Um, you know, it's very interesting. First of all, your poem was very spot on, and thank you so much for that. And to my other two sisters here, um, the work that I do right. actually is an intersection. It, it, it is inextricably linked to all that you just heard here, mm. right? Um, you know, I work with communities who are impacted by toxic pollution. Right. So when you talk about who do we call, right? In our world, it's a myriad of folks that we call. It's the State Department of Environment. It's the Schools Department. It's the Health Department. It's the city. It's the county. It's the state. It's the feds. It's the economic development. It's the so on and so on and so on. And what does that have to do with these sisters who were sitting here with us right now, when we think about depression, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we think about depression. We have laws, first of all, we have over 80,000 chemicals on the market. We're the canaries in the minefield, okay? 80,000 unregistered chemicals. And now we have ExxonMobil in charge of the State Department. Mm -hmm. And Pruitt, who was just confirmed, last not yesterday at epa and i need to i'm sorry i just need to take a pause and ask us to just pause in a quiet moment for our brothers and sisters in north dakota right now where they're clearing the camps with military force thank you and it's women and children that are holding it down. So these women and children are gonna be going in, possibly incarcerated, right? Because of the fact that they are holding down the human right to have clean drinking water. When, when we think about these toxics that are proliferating throughout our environment that we know create depression, cause depression, are in housing conditions that are inhabitable, inhabitable and somewhat habitable housing conditions that my sisters have to come out of the incarceration system to go into. Bed bugs and all these other things that are ramping through DC and we're spraying these pesticides, creating depression, violence, in utero exposure of chemicals to our children who were born depressed, born violent, and then Let's not just talk about Freddie Gray, who lived in a lead-infested home and his schools. In addition to that, I'm a graduate of Morgan. Mm -hmm. And I remember in the 90s when, when mothers took to the streets right there on Charles Street because of the fact that lead was being given to their children in the water, in the school system. And then just out the blue, they started uh, giving out bottled water, never told the children why they were giving out bottled water because of the fact that lead had been in the school drinking water, right? And this was the same time Freddie Gray was in school. These are the things that we are impacted. So that's why I said you call the health department, you call the city, you call, 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 but you just can't call. We have to organize and move and activate because unfortunately, it is the law mm -hmm. to do all of these things. Mm. <laughs> I was just got to sit there with that for a second. Yeah. Um, so I guess um, now that like we're realizing that the issues that we're dealing with is so multi-layered and at times it almost seems like the issues that we have to deal with are insurmountable mm -hmm. but i honestly believe that the reason why our histories are erased is because 
the system knows how powerful we are. Mm -hmm. um, and that the reason why that, you know, we talk about Sabrina Fulton, Trevor Barton's mother, you, we see um, movements like leveraging her, her suffering mm -hmm. and her pain, but not ever talking about this woman went to the mat for her child. Mm -hmm. um, so I I'm, I'm, guess what I'm trying to get at is how do we, as black women in the space, how do we move forward making sure that, um, that we know our histories, mm -hmm. that we know how powerful we are, and who we got to box with? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to throw it out to anyone. Lauren, do you want to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think most importantly, you create spaces like this. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, as individuals, when you feel the weight of all of the things that are against us, it can be overwhelming. And you can feel really small against all of these really large powers um, who are just really, you know, trying to do away with you and, like, again, erase you, mm -hmm. like, as a, as a human, you know? Right. And, um, again, I think it's important that you touched on, like, organizing and um, coming together. I think there's there's power in, in numbers because it's easy to feel small. So, again, organizing as, as, a, as, as a group, again, because it's also, like, the division, again. There's division within the community of Black women. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's, like, you know, having these spaces – where you, where you have, like, inclusion across, like, you know, all kinds of different spaces. You don't have to be Black to care about Black issues. You don't have to be trans to care about trans issues. Um, I think it's important that we just, you know, again, just foster these spaces where we can come together and organize, where there's not just one person who is saying, okay, here, here's what I want to do, and I wish I had all these people who could back me up. And, you know, it, just actually doing the work. It's like we talk about it, and it's like, you know, when is it getting done? Mm -hmm. um, and I think self-care. I think self-care mm -hmm. first before anything else is most important because you can't, you can't, you can't start a revolution if you're not taking care of yourself. Right. And it's easy to get lost and and depressed again when you see these images on TV. When you know the things that are happening, right? It's easy to just be like, man, I can't stand it. It's easy to get stuck and mm -hmm. feel the weight of everything on you. But again, just important to, to hold space and to be present and take care of yourself before you go out and fight. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. everyone can jump in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I will, I can, I can share a little bit about that from experience. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I recommend everyone here doing is whenever there is, um, whether it be in your job or whether you're just out, you know, and about, finding ways to disrupt the status quo wherever you are in whatever way that you can. So one, one thing, one way that's been able to help me, especially working, um, working at a nonprofit and doing the type of work that I do is, um, I mean, over a period of time, it, it took me a minute to feel like I had a voice mm -hmm. and not being afraid to, sometimes you got to be a target. You just have you just have to sometimes, mm -hmm. and um, doing something to just disrupt whatever this whatever the system that's in in place is, and sometimes it'll be scary, um, you know, and and at, at times you you just have to make a decision about what the impact is going to be from what from what you're doing. So, and this is just what again at at work. I mean, you know, we I work in a, in an industry, you know, the nonprofit industrial complex. Mm -hmm. Um, is, you know, it is real. And it, you know, it is um, sulking up resources from grassroots organizations that have been doing work before Donald Trump became a hot button issue. Mm. Um, and so what I've learned to do is to, when I see, you know, things that are creeping up where I, where I am at or in other spaces, say something. Say, you know, this is not you know, break this breaking and being the first person to say something because if, if not silence, um, you know, there, there's the quote, um, your silence won't protect you. Oh, dear Lord. Um, and one example of that would be the, um, the women's March on Washington, which is one of those, which is a perfect example of that. Um, that is an issue. Um, I don't know if you all know the backstory, but as you can see, the result of that um, of the march, which was wonderful and it was a great effort, 
but a lot of the backlash that came from that, it was one of the issues that I was speaking out heavily on. Um, and I can say that when I was first talk, speaking about, uh, about those issues back in the fall, back in around November, it felt like I was alone at first. Mm -hmm. It felt like I, you know, I, I was alone in talking about these issues. And now, months later, people are saying the same things that a lot of us were talking about. A lot of the, it were, a lot of the rooted issues with visibility of black women in the movement and that sort of thing. So just finding a talent or something that you can do, whether it be, it, it can be anything, writing, photography, um, anything, and using that as a way to shattering whatever the status quo is that it silences and hides and does not give credit to, to black women. So were you gonna say something? Yeah, um, as I was listening to all of you here, um, the, I serve 30 communities. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not alone in this. It's, in fact, it's a brother with me on this, okay? So uh, his name is Richard Moore, and he's out of, uh, out of New Mexico. Um, and Richard comes out of, out of the uh, civil rights movement, if you will. In fact, way, Richard, as he says, he's been around for 50 years, of the Chicano uh, movement. And and the Black and Brown uh, Berets, one of the founders of the Black and Brown Berets. One of the things that we do, especially with our Environmental Justice Health Alliance, we have, as I said, 30 communities and advocates amongst those communities as well, is that number one is with, it's not just about organizing, it's also about educating and educating on the issues at hand, the issues that got us to this place, right? The systemic racism, the impacts of capitalism, all of these types of things, right? But then not just stop there because they're, you know, folks always want to say, here come these people of color. They always got, you know, these black, brown folks always just want to yell and bitch and complain about something. But it's one thing to complain, it's another thing to have solutions. But you can't get to the solutions unless you go through the education of it all, right? Mm -hmm. It's just as you were saying about looking at the differences with the incarceration structure, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, what it is that we do with our communities and, 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 you, and it's wonderful to have a big collective behind you. But you don't really need a mm -hmm. big collective behind mm -hmm. you because I always say, what are you going to do the next day? What happens yeah, after the march home. when everybody goes home? Right. What you going to do, right? <laughs> what are you going to do? It's fabulous to have a march, right? It's fabulous to have a march. <laughs> but it's right on resistance to have actions and solutions. And this is what we're doing with our collective, where we are educating our collective on the impacts right. of the policies that have impacted them and then unpack that and then take that on to a point of creating their own destinies, creating their own political economies. In our world, you know, as you were, when I thought about it, you were talking about the number of women in, in uh, Louisville, Kentucky. One of my sheroes uh, is Ebony Cochran. Ebony Cochran, this is a bad mama jamma sister. That's who should be sitting here right now. <laughs> Ebony is from a community called uh, Rubber Town, which is West Louisville, Kentucky. And Ebony is an amazing sister, where first of all, the movement out of the, out of the REACT is what they call themselves. And they came out of, the, out of a civil rights organizing struggle. But then out of that civil rights organizing struggle, realized that their community was inundated with all this toxic pollution. They took on the state. They took on the city, right? And before you know it, now they have an air quality board there in Louisville that's supposed to look at the disproportionate impacts of, of this pollution. And that was because of the organizing efforts of this, this small group of women, right? Now, it just didn't stop there because it's a continuance. So now, a few weeks ago, they went back and they took on the EPA, the state, the, uh, the sewage, sewage board, the air quality board, and they did all of this before Obama was out of office because they wanted to make their stake and claim 
in the prior administration, right? This we're educating and organizing and strategizing comes along. So we were able to slam dunk them all <laughs> and make them all work together. So yes, Trump is in, but our folks, are, you know, as far as we are concerned, Trump is in our lives every day. So we're not reacting to Trump, right? And so therefore we have to be a Go ahead. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that because, you know, we got 500 plus years of oppression up in this camp. So don't act like it's something new. Trump is a fire. He's made in America for America by America. Okay? So now this is where we are. So that's why we've got to be educated, strategically smart. And the biggest thing of all is loving one another. Because right now, these for this fascism that's out here is out here hard, y'all. And they're trying to divide us all against one another. People of color, for most part. For the most part. And that's why I said we had to take a moment and take a silent moment for our Native brothers and sisters who are holding it down and standing rock, right? And this is where it's got to be, but we've got to educate, love ourselves, organize ourselves, and be strategically smart to take on this thing. We've gotten this far by faith, and we faith will lead us on. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> I want to follow up about institutions that like are supposed to protect us. So the EPA has an office of like civil rights, um, been around for like what thirty years, um, but hasn't put one civil rights claim against uh, any community when it's clear that like they're literally poisoning us. Um, when it comes to the Justice Department, even though we had a lot of lip service during the Obama administration uh, about my brother's creeper, about police reform, um, still with the second complaint against police officers is sexual assault when they're not killing us. Um, so I'm, what I'm seeing is that consistently mm -hmm. institutions that we pay into are not protecting us. Mm -hmm. So what do we have to do as, as a group? Uh, I know first we've got to educate ourselves, mm -hmm. but how do we protect ourselves? Um, I'm just going to leave it at that, that you guys fill in the inference. Yeah, I'm <laughs> going to get it, jump in. I think that's kind of like the same question. So I'm going to just think touch on what I was thinking of when I was listening to everybody talk. Mm -hmm. And I think that a few things that we need to think about is the first one is healing. Yeah. Because, I mean, from, from what I know, the system has never really did anything to protect us as black women. So I'm not really, I, I don't have that many expectations as far mm -hmm. as that goes. But I think that we could stand and take a look at healing as, as black women within the black community because I blame everything on Willie Lynch. And I think that a lot of our um, dysfunction within our uh, demographic mm -hmm. has a lot to do with our guilt and our need to um, be conscientious and protective of the men in our lives. And I've seen it in criminal justice and I've seen it in reentry. For example, um, if you go to any male prison on any weekend, you'll see tons of women and children in there visiting the men. Mm -hmm. The line will be around the corner. Whereas when you go into a female facility, the visiting room probably won't be full, but whoever's in it is going to be women and children visiting moms. It won't be husbands and brothers and uncles. That's just not the way our culture is designed. Mm -hmm. So then we get in these predicaments because we're women and not me. I wish I could tell the story of a, of a person who was not a criminal and got into the system because my boyfriend was a drug dealer. But that is the story of most women. That's not my story. Mm -hmm. So I get into these situations where I'm going into conspiracy cases with the men in my lives and I'm going into the system and I'm serving time and I'm disrupting my family and I'm experiencing all this psychological trauma. But who's supporting the women mm -hmm. throughout this process? Basically nobody or either other women right. you know, and their children. So I think that in order for us to better support one another, we have to heal from some of our psychological trauma of the past, mm -hmm. you know, with black men and with one another. Okay. Because when even me as a formerly incarcerated woman, when people talk to me about mass incarceration and reentry, I have to make an intentional effort to remember that my work is with women. Okay. Because I, I'm also equally passionate about what's happening to my brothers. Mm -hmm. So... 
And and another example I can use, my brother came home, he served 12 years, got home about a year before me. My mom gave him a bedroom in the basement. Mm -hmm. and when I came home, I ended up in the transitional house. I don't think my mom loves my brother any less than mm -hmm. she loved me. It's the mentality that we have. We love our sons and raise our daughters. There was an expectation that I would do what I needed to do to get my own. Whereas when my brother, my mother had a different type of commitment to him or a different type of loyalty, loyalty to him mm -hmm. than she offered to me as my mother, as her daughter, her right. youngest daughter of three, four. So I think we need to take a look at that. And, and I think that will enable us to unite more as, as black women mm -hmm. and better support each other as black women. I think one of the things that I, I run into a lot in the community is women who don't share my lived experience, who have the academic insight and the wisdom and the knowledge that have no interest in investing in formerly incarcerated women. In my mm -hmm. opinion, you're not a leader if you're not investing in other leaders. Mm -hmm. So I don't see myself as somebody that helps returning women. I invest in them and my goal is to empower them so that they can tell the, shape their narrative mm -hmm. and have an impact on the policy and on the programs and on the institutions that are leading our women into prison and basically leaving our children, our communities bankrupt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Healing, I think um, that's something that, like firsthand I can like talk about and um, again, education first, because I didn't even know what depression was. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. experiencing all of these symptoms, but black girls wasn't depressed. The only time I heard about depression and the mental illnesses is when a white boy shot up a school. And um, so I couldn't attack depression. I couldn't fight depression. Mm -hmm. I couldn't heal myself if I didn't mm -hmm. know about it. Mm -hmm. What I know what was happening to me. And then also like with understanding my own depression, I could analyze my mother's and her anxiety mm -hmm. disorder. Mm -hmm. um, most recently, um, maybe a few months ago, I had um, problems with um, ovarian cysts. And I had to do a lot of research on where they come from and um, how they affect black women more than anybody else. Mm -hmm. My grandmother passed away from ovarian cancer. Um, my father most recently passed away from colon cancer, which is linked to ovarian cancer. It's just how it affects men. Um, and just doing research because again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dead. I, I can't move out of my bed because I'm having these issues with my reproductive organs as, you know, a woman. And just, you know, again, doing research and understanding that, you know, where these things come from first educating myself so that I then can fight back against them. Mm -hmm. um, I had to have surgery twice. I was looking at a third surgery until I found out what I had to do to heal myself mm -hmm. um, so that these things would stop happening to me. Again, the chemicals in the food. Mm -hmm. um, again, the chemicals in the water, not just food, just the water. And mm -hmm. even um, the labels on organic food um, are not always 100% organic. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I am eating a mostly plant-based diet. Again, you have to think of things like accessibility. I can't walk into right. my local grocery store That's and right. find organic anything. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just important to, okay, once you educate, you have to heal every part of yourself yeah. Um, yeah. so that you can have the strength enough to fight. And love, oh my gosh, I can't speak wow. on how much love is so important. Love for yourself, when it's true, it radiates out onto other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so again, you have to heal yourself first so that you can then heal the women that not only come before you, but the women that will come after you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, man, love yourself. Drink some water. Drink some water. Right? Yeah. I want people like you drink some water. Like yeah. yeah. We, um, you know, we sued the government um, and won under the Obama administration. There were, there were things that Obama did do mm -hmm. that I didn't agree with all the things that the brother did, but but there were things that we did, and I see why they want the country back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we had some inside-outside dances going on. And, and what do I mean by that? There were people of color, black women, especially right on to my black women sisters, who were in the U.S. State Department and in the EPA, who were holding it down inside while we hold it down outside, right? And so we work it out right and we worked it out inside and outside west virginia how many people recall when the west virginia that that water crisis happened yeah. and three hundred thousand people were without water right mm -hmm. um and it turns out 
that um, the company that uh, that's, that spilled this contaminant into the water had not been inspected in over 10 years, um, then went bankrupt on the heels of, of spilling the water of uh, this contaminant into there. And this is when Obama and I did never disagreed on this uh, clean coal. There is no clean coal. And to show you how much is not clean coal, the contaminant that contaminated the Elk River was, the, was used to clean the coal. But you couldn't drink the water after it contaminated the water. So how clean, Brother Obama, was that, right? And so with respect to that, we wound up having to sue the United States government because it turned out our good friends at the NRDC, the Natural Resource Defense Council, our, our lawyer friends, right? This is what our lawyer friends are for. And this is what my sister's inside this ACLU to do, right? Is to help us be able to push these lawsuits out there and get the reforms that we need. So we were able to sue the government, found out that the above ground storage tank rule that was part of the Clean Water Act, and by the way, let's go back to Schoolhouse Rock, the Clean Water Act came into play 42 years ago. They didn't turn on all of the act. <laughs> so, the above ground storage tank rule was never implemented. Mm -hmm. But yet we got above ground storage tanks in communities that look like ours. Mm -hmm. West Virginia, one of them, black women, West Virginia State, historically black college, right? Institute West Virginia, that's where this happened. Now, just to flip and go quickly into another piece, when you talked about food sources, another piece that we're taking on is the dollar stores. Family Dollar, Dollar Tree, Dollar General. You go and you smell this vinyl, these phthalates, they're calling them. Vinyl on the, uh, the bisphenol A on the can liners. Cheese, that's really not cheese. You set it on fire, that girl will burn like whatever, right? And so we're taking these places on because you talk about access. Are we trying to shut down the dollar store? No. What we are trying to do is change the political economy of the dollar store. An example, my sister's hometown, Albuquerque, New Mexico, South Valley of Albuquerque, New Mexico. There's 14 farms, organic farms in the hood. Our people, right? Volunteer farms, they have a collective, these 14 farms. We're going to the dollar store general managers, going to the heads of these dollar stores and say, if you're going to be a good neighbor, then let's talk about how we have real political economies in our neighborhoods, that you take in our food sources, sell organic foods in here, sell the lettuce in here. We're willing to work on the price and work it out sell the soaps that our sisters and brothers make out of the organic, we're willing to work it out, right? And, and just the very last piece, we're on our way next, next month or the month after next to the shareholder meeting to let Dollar Tree know we ain't playing. You haven't called us back. We've been on Facebooks and all these other things. Jennifer Beal has run it up on, we've had, uh, commercials and what have you, people have called in, told, we said you want, we want a meeting, they haven't responded, well now we're going to go to your bottom line, we're going to hit your shareholders, we're going to show up at your front door at the shareholder meeting. These are all the different ways in which you scale the beast. You have to hit that capitalism piece at their bottom line. You have to hit the law but you have to hit the law and reform the law to make the law work for you. Will it happen overnight? No, hell no. But we're at a point where we're sitting in a space like this, where yesterday we wouldn't have been able to sit in a space like this. So the thing is, the march is over. What you gonna do tomorrow? That's it. Um, so I wanna follow up on like, how do we keep up this momentum? Like I have to admit that when Obama got elected, I showed out and I was like, whoop. Works done. I know. <laughs> I was like, 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 like we didn't there. Um, <laughs> and it turns out that's not what happened. No. And I honestly think like the election of Donald Trump isn't necessarily a white laugh. I think it's this 
the system overcorrecting. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama was not supposed to be in that space, and the American car was like, nope, and pulled it mm -hmm. well, all the way to the right. So I'm trying to figure out, like, <laughs> yeah, I love it. all the way to literally. the right. <laughs> literally. How, um, I want to make, uh, we have all this momentum right now because we got this Cheeto that scares everyone, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but how do we make sure that after um, 45 is out of office, that we remember that it doesn't matter who comes in. I don't care if Michelle Obama gets elected. Right. Um, we need to hold our people to the plane. And what's happening is that we, we get, you know, a friendly face. Mm -hmm. I mean, we let Bill Clinton get one over on us. We let Obama to the Senate get away without not helping us. So what do we need to do to make sure we keep this momentum going? Okay. Um, yeah. So I think that, um, I mean, a lot of the conversation so far has reminded me a lot about the Baltimore Uprising, which is um, probably one of the most, um, that was quite an experience yeah. um, back in 2005, and which we are still dealing with a lot of the neighborhoods where the uprising took place still look the same. Um, so I think that one of the, I mean, based off that experience, because right, if, if all of you are following right now, the DOJ came into Baltimore, um, and right now we're, we were in the process of negotiating a consent decree, um, a Department of Justice report came out in the fall that was citing what we know, um, police abuses, um, sexual assault, women who were sexually assaulted, and, and, and that sort of thing. So we are currently in the process now of, um, of working, with, working with them, working in local policing coalitions um, and statewide coalitions to doing, to doing this work. And one, from the uprising, what I see a need is in order to answer the question of what do you do after the march mm -hmm. is seriously, seriously investing in organizations and individuals and people who are on the ground. I, I just can't, I can't say that enough um, because they way. are the people who are doing, um, I mean, yeah, from the uprising, for example, there was, we now had the Black Church Security Network that, um, that are producing farms in Baltimore City right now. Um, you know, there are, great, there are organizations who work around police reform and who can show up at the doorstep and put on the pressure um, doing the work that institutions like to tiptoe around sometimes depending on who it is. Um, I mean, that is, for me, from what I've seen being inside and outside, that is where the power is. Um, you know, right now, even with the marches that's going on, um, and, you know, there's a lot of money being fundraised for a lot of different organizations, and you have to ask yourself, where is this money going? Mm -hmm. And what is being done with the funds that are, that are being raised? Mm -hmm. um, so community supporting, supporting people who look like you who are doing the work where you are. Um, I think that the media, and because I do media communications, I've put a lot of, a lot, fault the media a lot for making um, black issues popular and relevant when they want it, when they want us to. Mm -hmm. And not mm -hmm. decide, like not, um, you know, letting them decide mm -hmm. what's important for us and, and, what, and what's not. Um, and which they heavily uh, contribute to, especially around the uprising. Because what, if you weren't there, you were just reading about what was happening on, like, on, on the outside. Um, you know, the cars being blown, or uh, being, you know, right. right. And like the stores, um, some stores being bro broken into. But people got to understand um, the uprising, that was when people that were in their communities, I mean, we've done this before. With all these marches and stuff happening right now, we've done this already. We've done it before. And we owe it to people who live in, the, in, in these communities. Um, we owe them something, especially folks like me, who, and a lot of us, like you, you mentioned the you know, academic mm -hmm, folks, mm -hmm. right? Like they're working in institutions that are college educated and all this, all this stuff. It's like we, we have a responsibility um, to always bring that conversation to the table when we're in spaces, which I was talking about earlier, about disrupting the status quo whenever you can mm -hmm. and not being afraid to be a target of you because you will become that sometimes. Um, you will. It yeah. just, that's just what you, that's sometimes that's just what you got to do um, because the question, no matter who it is, is who are you accountable to? Right. I'm accountable to people who look like me from where I come from in Baltimore. Mm -hmm. That's who I, that's who Brittany Oliver is mm -hmm. accountable to. 
And, you know, so we got to, we have to, add, add, you know, ask those questions um, and really think about, um, I, 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 another thing I'm thinking about is just connecting with elders. Mm. Like black people need to connect with elders who have been <laughs> doing work, who've been doing this before me, yeah. before it's like right now, the internet is making mm -hmm. things so trendy and social media and yeah. like hashtags. And it's yeah. like, Y'all know there are people who are do like who are alive right now, political prisoners right now who've been doing this work, um, and activists um, who who have been doing. It. We we need to reach out to them. We need to connect with them and get some guidance, especially young the you know the younger you know folks about what was done and what worked and what didn't work. Um, because we shouldn't have needed a hashtag to say Black Lives Matter. <laughs> we know it matters. Right. Um, it was, the, and, and again, it's me like always holding the media account accountable. We, let's not wait until the media says something is important for us to really, really do what's necessary for Black people. Um, so I have two more questions before we make it out into the breakout session. Right. Um, and this one um, is, I want uh, for Lauren. Um, so when we talk about like politics liberation, right? Like I literally see it developing in places that like the mainstream society wouldn't think as political. So like hip hop, poetry, mm -hmm. Black Twitter, because Twitter wouldn't be here right now if it wasn't for Black Twitter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we want to be Black Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm trying to like um, Lauren. How does like um, activism inform your art or? art and form your activism. Um, so um, I forget who I'm quoting, but um, self-love or self-healing is a form of uh, revolution. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and I think when I first got into performance poetry, I was still kind of like really shy and really quiet mm -hmm. because I used my art as a way to try to heal myself and to talk about things that I felt like I wasn't allowed to talk about. Um, and I guess growing older and moving forward in um, my art and activism. I think poetry specifically um, gives me a, not only a way to say things that I feel like I can't say, but also it brings um, in a lot of different cases an audience mm -hmm. um, of people who will listen to what you have to say. Um, otherwise, you know, who, who wouldn't? Um, and I don't know. I feel like I am. I am a, a, just a revolution, just in being. Mm. Um, so in everything that I do, decide to do, is revolution, and it is um, activism. I am choosing to still exist and be here and mm -hmm. be present and to speak my story without, you know, letting all of the things that just people, all of the things that are trying to silence me, because my own depression tries to silence me sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I feel like I am fighting and um, being an activist by literally just being. Um, and especially like, because I'm not only like a spoken word artist, but I also paint. Um, and I'm not painting things like, oh, Black Lives Matter or, you know, what we would consider activism right. um, and this idea of activism. Um, I usually just paint what I see in my dreams. Um, that Because I, I see Black women in my dreams who are extraterrestrial, who are powerful, who have yeah. superpowers. Um, and I think that's reality. Yeah. And, um, you know, other people may take from it what they can, but I think just, just being alive and being present and seeing it and, and acknowledging and being intentional with your presence is activism enough. I um, hope I didn't stray too far away from the question. Yeah, thank you. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is the last question. This is for everyone on the panel. Everyone here is doing really um, heavy emotional labor. Um, and but y'all still show up y'all still pretty strong even though i know this time to tired i wanted to like hit back on like self-healing like yes. what are you guys doing like individually like, what do you do to like take that step back just to take a deep breath and um recharge and i'll start off with you Lashonia. i used to exercise a lot but i don't do that anymore which is not good but I rely a lot on my family, my support system. My daughter is hit with me here tonight. She drove me here. <laughs> um, and my husband, who's also a returning citizen, I think that um, the fact that he has that lived experience and we can relate to one another and support one another in ways that, you know, we may not be able to if we haven't, hadn't had that experience. And um, the women of the wire, 
that kind of brings me back to your previous question when you asked, what is it going to take for us to maintain this momentum? Mm -hmm. And I go back to, I think, investing into women and empowering them to be motivated to do the work and, and healing and unifying and supporting one another will enable us to continue to do the work because it can be exhausting, if that's a, a good enough word. Mm -hmm. And I think about um, Zora Neale Hurston, my favorite quote, women are the muse of the world. Mm -hmm. I've literally only been home for five years and it feel like I've been doing this work for 15 years easily yeah. mm -hmm. because of all the opposition and mm -hmm. all of the trauma and all of the divisiveness. If only we could just come together Mm -hmm. heal as individuals and support each other and unify, I think that the momentum would gain because the work wouldn't be as challenging and, and as difficult because we all have so much to bring to the table. And, you know, like Malcolm said, if the fingers are split, a slap don't hurt as bad as a fist. Mm -hmm. And we really have to unite if we want to keep the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle? Yeah, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's very important for self-healing. Um, I wake up mostly every morning at 4 a.m. And, and spend quiet time with my divine. And, and I don't, <laughs> as much as I know about the news and everything and what goes on in the world, I don't listen to it mm -hmm. until after 10 o'clock. Um, in the morning, um, I, I just listen to fun stuff and I laugh or whatever in the morning, but I just cannot. Um, I travel a lot with the work that I do. Um, and so I'm in a lot of communities, um, but I also have the opportunity to travel and the, uh, the blessing to be able to travel to places like New Mexico, where I actually just came back from uh, Monday. And had the privilege of while I was in community with folks in Taos, New Mexico, up in northern New Mexico, but actually had the privilege to go to the river, um, to give back to the river and baptize myself back with the river mm -hmm. there. And um, the communities I serve mm -hmm. um, are, they are. We have an intergenerational. Uh, movement we it's elders and and youth and and we build with one another and we pray we cry we laugh we do all that together um and so it's self-care is very important um and as a as one mother cole god rest her soul used to say from mossville louisiana you just gotta stay prayed up she said <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what we do and we and you have to you have to be able to believe in in something as I share with the young people and I'll just stop here. You have I, I share with young people that we, we have an intergenerational youth training in the summer, like an intensive boot camp, if you will, and we bring the elders in for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And um and you know, as I share with the young with the young people that um this just didn't start with you. It won't end with you. And if, even if you're by yourself, you must stand with your stick and you define what that stick is. Mm -hmm. But that stick is your divinity and that will carry you through and you'll never be alone. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Wow. Um, so self-care, I think for me, um, one of, I think when I, when I decided at some point in my, in the work that I do to, um, Self-care for me is spending time um, building community mm -hmm. with black people, black women when I'm not mm -hmm. outside, when I'm outside of my, um, you know, when I'm in my own time. That's been incredibly helpful for me um, because what it does for me is it helps me to see um, black beings, black people as human beings. So we don't, you know, we're just like everyone else. We don't say the right things all the time. We don't do the right, we, you know, we're, we, are, we are complex beings. And so being in community with black and brown folks um, as much as I can, whether it be through dance, I, I love dancing. Um, there is a really huge swing in Lindy Hop 
um, community in Baltimore that I'm a part of, as well as African dancing and that sort of thing. So a lot of spiritual things um, that I like to do. But if, in, in a nutshell, if I could describe self-care, that is what it would be because I didn't spend a lot of time building with, with people who look like me throughout college and, um, you know, working in, in, you know, in an institutional, in, a, in, in an industry um, that, um, you know, the social justice work or um, sometimes it, um, it does not, it doesn't allow it. it, it, it it's, it's a much deeper conversation, but just the idea of what justice looks like. Mm -hmm. Being in community with black people helped me to discover what that means mm -hmm. and what it looks like and how different it is culturally. Um, so that is so that's been very healing for me. That's what I like to do. Yeah. And then Lauren, did you, I know you spoke about it a few times earlier, but do you want to add anything else about your self-care regimen? Um, yeah, um, this is a thing that I was just thinking. Um, I think that, again, with the last question that you asked me, I think knowing your place mm -hmm. and your space makes it so that your self-healing and your self-care coincides with the work that you're doing. Mm -hmm. So for me, I know that being out marching, that's not for me. Mm -hmm. um, I know for me, I know a lot of like my close friends who um, spend a lot of time building spaces for people to come together. That's not my work. That's not my place because it doesn't make me feel good. What makes me feel good is writing poems and painting pictures. Mm -hmm. And I can't let nobody tell me that that's not, you know, or what I should be doing if it interrupts mm -hmm. my sanity. Because mm -hmm. um, again, you can't, you can't fight something if you're exhausted and depressed all the time. Mm -hmm. it just, it just doesn't work like that. So being completely in tune and in love with yourself and knowing exactly what you want to do and what makes you feel good is exactly what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, it's just about listening to yourself mm -hmm. and what, and you know, because. We are our own teachers, and all everything you need to know is in yourself. Mm -hmm. And I do have a poem on self love and mm -hmm. um, self healing that I think I don't know if now is appropriate. Do you want to do it towards the end of the I mean, after the session? Oh yeah, see, I have to leave it exactly mm -hmm. seven thirty. Oh, uh, then I think it might be the perfect time. <laughs> <laughs> There's another version of this poem that uh, a lot of people talk about, um, what I call my introduction poem. Mm -hmm. And this was me rewriting something that I wrote maybe a few years ago. Um, and I think it speaks a lot on what, everything that we just talked about. So, Hi, everybody. My name is Lauren, and I have no idea what I'm doing ever. <laughs> I know one thing is that I know everything if I am patient. I tell people my dreams and they laugh. Tell me to get real and come back down to earth, but I tell them that the clouds are much better up here. I am ashamed when I'm happy. Like who am I to see sunshine through the shit storm? I run to the bathroom and cry because I miss my father or because I'm not allowed to miss my father or because the world would not stop spinning just because I start to. My world catches on fire and all I can do is watch it burn and be reborn. I emerge on the other side of fatherless woman in her second semester of community college, free from all the pretty organs that gave her the right to bear life once. Why do all the black girls I know have a miscarriage or two? They still won't stop offering me birth control. My tummy is already empty. Do I have an excuse to be depressed now? Can I be amongst the masses who have reasons if I know one thing is that I'm good at dancing with my eyes closed? I giggle when the wind hits my blunt. The trees laugh with me, you know, this is happy, you feel me? I am allowed to feel both. What would happiness be without sadness? At least Disney made one good movie. The birds are back and singing and preparing their homes. I am best at sunset. I am calm and things change. The sky slips into her little black dress after blowing out her fire. See, this is home, closest to the stars. I am extraterrestrial at these moments, whole and happy. The moon moves me like wind and trees. My mother frantically searches for contact clues. I'm tired can mean that I'm being more productive or that I am severely depressed, but who knows? I'm being black and blowing money on concerts out of town because culture is important. I'll green in the mornings and red bush tea. No name helping me with my homework, cozy and free time. Kendrick is in Miami next month and Migos just might start the revolution. 
It feels so good to be made from stars dipped in sun. I know you want in on this skin, but it is mine and whole, and nothing would be if I wasn't anyway. Nothing mm. would be if I wasn't here first anyway. Let's not forget that there is a universe in my womb. I am it. I am everything. I am Earth. Oh. Thank you so much for that. Um, so we started off a bit late, but I really want to introduce a concept of breakout session for you guys. Um, so if you guys are comfortable with staying for a bit 15 minutes later than expected, let's stay up. Everyone okay with that? Let me know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we won't let you stay. We won't let you stay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to point to you, and I want you to count um, one, two, three, four. Um, so this we're counting my numbers. Um, if you get one, top right hand corner. Um, two, that corner right there. Three is this corner right there. Four, that corner right there. Um, <laughs> what we're going to do at this point is um, come back together as a group. And each one of the panelists, I want you guys to um, state the question you had and then the main themes that came out in this conversation. Um, and then final thoughts. And then we'll, we'll head on out. That sound for the other one? Yes. Okay. Oh, everyone kind of looks like you might want to add. Oh, sorry about that. So all the panelists, I'm going to have everyone, we're going to come back there as a group. So turn your chairs generally this direction towards them. Um, panelists come back to the panel. Um, you guys are going to do a little, share the themes that um, were most prominent in your discussion, and then give your final thoughts just about whatever about that moment that's moving at the moment. Hey, Mandisa? I'm standing. I'm standing. Yeah. Nicole, can you go to Mandisa because she's going to go to Tisa? Can you go to Tisa? Can you do the Tisa? Can you do the Tisa? Can you do the Tisa? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're on the panel, so. <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> Okay, so I'm not on the panel. I'm Ann Visa. I also work here at IPS. Um, it was a group of Black women who put this together, and I'm very proud to be a part of that. In our group, we talked about intersectionality. Um, we talked about the privileges that we felt that we had based off of our identity and where we came from. We talked about the spaces and places where we felt that we got pushed back, that we were getting oppressed, that we did not have privilege. And we talked about how those things intersect. We tried to give really specific examples in our life. Um, people talked about like being a federal worker and a black woman. We mm. talked about like globalized racism when you travel. We talked about like, okay, I'm a white woman. What does it really mean to be an ally? You know, it means showing up. It means other people see me as an ally. I just can't define myself that mm. way. It has to be a definition we agree on because you know, the communities of color have to be empowered, right? So those are the type of things that we talked about. And then we also talked about so you understand all that, that's cool, but how do you go forward and actually make change? And are you actually going to use that, your own experience to uplift and to change? And are you also going to uplift others who are not as empowered as you are, who, who need that space and that place, who need that narrative change? And again, we connected it to the examples we had shared. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we, have a, we had a conversation about the rise um, of incarceration weight rate for black women, the number of children who currently have incarcerated parents. And um, we sh shared a story about uh, in a young man who currently has a mom who's serving two life sentences. And um, the prison where she is is very far from where he lives. And some of the things that we discussed was in terms of um, what has, the question was what has happened to us as a society that, um, has uh, enabled us to accept these current statistics or the current plight of black women as it relates to mass incarceration. Like what do these facts say about us? What does it say about black women, black motherhood or black children? And we came up with um, the fact that black women and black children are undervalued um, and that the community lacks um, knowledge about what's actually happening on a larger scheme, even though we all probably see it in our families 
or in our communities, but we don't understand like the massive rate at which women, black women have become incarcerated. We also talked about um, what can we do as a community to support children who have incarcerated mothers and the fact that we think that they're um, unfortunately the next in line to be, fill up the prisons if we don't do something to support them and make sure that they're healthy because we do know that America's not going to stop blowing up mountains and building prisons and somebody has to fill the beds and they already have the men and the women so what else is there left? And um, in order for us to, you know, take back our children and make sure that they don't end up in that pi pipeline, what can we do? So we came up with things like community organizing, um, coalition building, uh, raising more awareness, and coming up with self-help organizations or programs within the communities where we can support these families and these children without needing financial support from um, the government or any other entity. And um, one of the things I thought was really interesting is the individual who spoke about his work in Palestine and the oppression that he's seeing over there with the women who are being um, basically uh, incarcerated and violated in a major way and how this these statistics reminded him a lot of the work that he's doing over there and how it's strategic and it's all counter resistance I think is the word he used and that it's not coincidental or something that just happened like this all was by design and it all was by plan so some of the things that we wanted to walk away with is um a conscious commitment to be more empathetic toward um children who have incarcerated mothers and for incarcerated parents and to build relationships with children who have incarcerated parents and create surrogate families around them if we know any children that fit that demographic or maybe intentionally actually go out and find out who these children are in your community because we know that they do exist because these stats say that one in nine black children have a parent in prison. Thank you. So we talked about um, how um, the vote of black women is valued or not mm -hmm. um, and looked at the fact that um, there was a high percentage of black women that supported Hillary Clinton and at the end um, are now left. And the Democratic National Committee is grappling with how it is, their, what their identity looks like, who it is that they speak to. Um, and it's quite interesting that they're grappling with who it is they speak to, um, but the demographics show that there were very high rates of black women who supported them. It was then compared to that of the Women's March and you were able to see even with that, um, that that was, there was, as you say, the backstory of how it was women of color had to more or less push their way into that piece. Um, uh, and, and even their issues, if you will, uh, as a result of that. Um, we talked about the fact that patriarchy has actually played a huge role and, and even that of racism and oppression um, with an example looking at Donna Edwards, who was, um, who was here, she, this woman was running for United States Senate, but was not supported by the party um, and even by the Congressional Black Caucus to go even further, simply because of the fact that she beat Al Wynn um, to get the position that she had before. And Al Wynn was the president of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, right? And he ceded over to the Clintons and gave the whole CBC basically, so it was this debacle, if you will. So the undervalue of black women, even amongst our own folks, showing that we must love and, uh, and support one another. And we talked about how it is we make um, environmental justice a more core and fundamental issue and talked about how we must also understand that the environmental justice movement redefined environmentalism as to where we live, where we work, where we play, where we pray, where we go to school. So it is our life and our legacy. It is the fact that we must be able to fight for the fact that we are land uh, for that land-based peace in addition to that health. 
when we look at, uh, it was mentioned that in Korea, they were saying that uh, health, uh, because of health care is a fundamental right, there's a lot of healthy people. Mm -hmm. In Venezuela, we learned and we know through our environmental justice work and interaction and our climate work as we traveled to Venezuela a couple of years ago, learned that how, the, how they take the funds from the oil industry and put it back into the people, into healthcare, education, and what have you, right? And so therefore looking at how it is they make a more productive um, uh, person of that country as opposed to using that industrial uh, industrialization to break down um, communities. Um, and did I get everything that was about it? That's it? Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I will I will try my best to make sure I have everything. So one of the, one of the things that we talk a few of the things we talk about one um, is um, black women owning their own institutions um, and building those things so that we can have can, we can, can can control the narrative about our stories and what we write about um, and not so that we don't have to depend on uh, you know media to tell our stories for us um, education. Um, came up, so sending in people who look like um, who look like us into communities. Um, a lot of times in a lot of different in industries, such as social work, um, you know, nonprofits. I mean, it can. This really is, you know, meaningful for a lot of different industries where we send people into communities who don't look like the community where mm -hmm. folks are from, and so there's a disconnect about what um, you know. In, in turn, there's a disconnect with under the understanding of what you know, having, making a difference looks like. That mm -hmm. looks different depending on where you come from, what your socioeconomic set, uh, background, that sort of thing. So sending people in, um, and one example that we talked about was, for example, if there's a Native American community, you wouldn't send me into the Native American community. I would decline that offer. If someone wanted to send me to a community to talk about issues that are culturally sensitive to them, you don't send me, you would send someone from that community. Um, and that's the way that we feel as our education, we work most with black people. Um, disrupting the normalization of white supremacy in academia. Mm. Mm. Um, so terms and um, thought, the, you know, the way that we think about, um, you know, what liberation looks like and that sort of thing, that looks very different. Um, and, 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 and these are ideas that have been grafted and have been created for us um, and they need to be created by us. Um, demanding that social justice movements, we also talk about demanding um, that anyone that's involved in social justice movements um, learn how to take leadership from marginalized communities, mm. right? So like not coming up with practices and policies and ideas, but, but listening to the people that you say that you serve and taking leadership from those people. Um, because if you're not doing it the other way, or if you're not, if you're not doing that, then you're, um, you know, you're, you are a part of the problem, basically. Um, and one thing I actually added, um, because I was thinking about this, but we didn't have time to talk about it, was thinking about colonialism and how colonialism has, um, and like westernized values and morals, how these things have um, encouraged us to think about black people, mm. what we can and what we can't do. Yep. And, and, um, and as I explained earlier, we are complex beings. So, you know, we don't say the right things all the time, or, you know, sometimes we, sometimes we say, we do certain things, we participate, we have behaviors, um, ideas, that's complex, but because of where we live and because of slavery is one of those, um, you know, events that happen, we've been um, forced to think about uh, liberation in a way that we have not had full autonomy to craft and develop. Um, so disrupting that. Mm. All right. Well, I mm. want to first take a moment to thank you all for coming out. Um, thank it you. Was an absolute privilege to listen to you guys. Um, perspective and I feel like everyone um, here is grateful for that. So I just wanted to know the shot shout out. <laughs> um, so, you might have, um, so you might have noticed in the questions I was asking and in the breakout sessions that a lot of questions were, so what is the next step? What are we going to do and what are you going to do? So um, when you're leaving this space, I want you guys to, I honestly believe that together and yes. individually, we do have the power to push these narratives, to bring down these institutions, to change our society. Um, so let's think about what you can do 
on the personal level. It don't gotta be big. You don't gotta go out there and start the revolution. But just know that the first step starts with you. And with that, thank y'all for coming out and stay late with us. And <laughs> Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Thank our facilitator.